We are talking today to Craig Ryan, the author of Sonic Wind, the story of John Paul Staff and how a renegade doctor became the fastest man on the earth. On earth. So you're welcome to Radara listeners and audience, and uh, we are excited learning more about your book, about you, and of course about the character and the uh, or the main uh, focus of the book as well. Maybe if you can explain a little bit, uh, how did you get interested in the person and the uh, uh, the topic of the book? Well, I first encountered uh, Dr. John Paul Stapp, who's the subject of my biography. Uh, let's see, back in October of 1990, I was actually doing research on an earlier book and uh, encountered Dr. Stapp and his story, and um, I considered him the greatest man I'd ever met, uh, and that was not only because of his intellect and his many accomplishments, but also because of uh, the essential humanity that he just radiated uh, when I met him. He, he was clearly a very unusual man, and it, it took me a while to really find out how unusual. But when you add up you know, all his achievements and this, this amazing intellect with an extraordinary sense of humor, which I later found out was, was really at the core of his character, um, it seemed to me just a story that was waiting to be told. And I thought, the world needs to know about John Paul Stapp. Mm-hmm. And I'm glad you did because the book turned out to be very good and, and uh, it's also very interesting. Thank you. Um, would you explain uh, what is the main message that you want to take it away or that you want to give it to the readers? Our readers should be learning from this book. How? What is that your central message is? Well, again, this is you know this is a biography, so this is the story of a man's life. But there's there's certainly a theme to it. Um, Doctor Stapp's entire life was devoted to and focused on really one thing, and that was protecting what he called the pathetically vulnerable human being from the violence of crash forces. And um, I believe, I, I state in the book, and, and I believe this to be true, that um, Dr. Stapp can be considered to have saved, directly or indirectly, more lives, more lives than anyone in human history. And those lives include the, the legion of survivors of both aircraft and ground vehicle crashes. He referred to those folks as ghosts that never happened. Um, Stapp was, I, I think, at the very core of his character, offended by the fact that um, as the 20th century progressed and um, automobiles and aircraft increasingly uh, went at faster speeds and, be, and uh, were more and more capable, the human being remained the same. And, um, uh, you know, it, it's one thing to, to bump into another car at 20 miles an hour. But if you're going 80 miles an hour on the freeway and you crash, that's quite another thing. And so Stapp's um, sort of the evangelical fervor was to figure out how to protect human beings um, when they uh, encounter the, the, the horrific violence that, that occurs in, in, in modern vehicles when they crash. So that's the theme of the book, I think, um, figuring out how to save lives uh, in, in the modern world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Before we go into the person, uh, uh, Dr. Staff, is maybe if we can focus on it, some of the most uh, important achievements that we all today uh, benefit from or we take it for granted. Sure. Staff's list of achievements is, is quite long, but um, they certainly include probably the, the first real significant uh, achievement in his life was uh, a research project he did in the Air Force that identified a process called denitrogenization, which is, uh, it, it's a long word, but what it really means is how to get nitrogen out of the human bloodstream for pilots in high altitude aircraft. Um, what Stapp had discovered um, in some research he did at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio was that when human beings in an aircraft that you know go above 20,000, 30,000 feet suffer the bends, the same thing that happens to deep sea divers when they when they go down and come up too fast. The nitrogen in the bloodstream expands. Uh, it's incredibly painful, and um, if the expansion happens fast enough, it can be fatal. And Stapp realized that if uh, uh, pilots are going to be able to, to go higher and higher in these aircraft, we we're going to have to figure out a way to keep them safe. And so he came up with a process called pre-breathing that allowed pilots to uh, 
uh, evolved pilots breathing 100% oxygen for some period of time before they went up to a higher altitude. And by getting that nitrogen out of their bloodstream, uh, they avoided the effects of the bends. So that's really where it started with Stapp. He went on from there to try to discover the limits of human, human tolerance to deceleration forces. And the reason that was important was because we were beginning to put, uh, after following World War II, put ejection seats into high-speed aircraft. And when a pilot ejects in an emergency from a high-speed airplane, um, it's something like hitting a brick wall. You're going, say, 650 miles an hour, 750 miles an hour, and you're, you suddenly go to zero when you eject, eject out of that plane. Could human beings even tolerate that level of deceleration? Would it be possible to keep someone alive in a situation like that? And so he ran some um, um, amazingly spectacular tests in the desert of California and New Mexico to try to determine the exact limits that human beings could uh, could tolerate in, in in these kinds of situations. And if you think about it, it's not just ejection seats out of aircraft, but if you're um, going down the car on a highway at 60 miles an hour and you hit um, a, a rigid structure, you're going to go from whatever speed you're traveling to zero very, very quickly. And so what he wanted to know was, can human beings survive that level of deceleration? And if so, what kind of uh, protection do we need to give them to keep them alive in a situation like that. So um, he ran some tests on a vehicle that was called a rocket sled. If you can imagine um, a steel soapbox racer on a railroad track with um, a rocket engine on the back of it shooting you down that track at amazing speed and then slamming to a stop, uh, Stapp did that experiment again and again and again with himself as the subject of the experiment. Um, he was unwilling to... to um, subject someone else to that kind of violence. And so he, he took the task on himself and ran these tests with himself essentially as a guinea pig. And what he was able to prove is that the human being can survive unbelievable crash forces and deceleration forces if they're properly restrained. And uh, it was really an, an important discovery because without that, um, I, it would not have been possible for human beings to um, to do very much in terms of supersonic aircraft and eventually spacecraft, um, re-entry into Earth atmosphere, going from a tremendously high speed to a much slower speed very quickly. There was a lot of research that needed to be done, and uh, Stapp did all that research, and he did it on himself. It was really, uh, a, a really, it was, it was a very um, uh, amazing set of experiments that he ran, and and incredibly brave that he was willing to run them on himself himself and you know the films and photographs of these tests are still available and when you see these films you, you can hardly believe what you're seeing it's really extraordinary stuff mm -hmm. why why was it that before staff did the experiment that people believed that the human cannot may not survive this uh, dramatically large acceleration and de deceleration forces well, I think that the honest answer is that the experiments had not been done. No one had ever um, really envisioned and then carried out the experiments that Stapp uh, put together in California and New Mexico. And the Air Force, uh, at their School of Aviation Medicine, where they trained their pilots, had uh, rather arbitrarily uh, determined that the limit of human tolerance was 18 times gravity. And that if a human body was was exposed to a deceleration of greater than 18 times gravity, um, the internal organs would rupture, um, and, uh, brain hemorrhages hemorrhages would occur, and uh, it wouldn't be possible to survive it. So the 18 g limit was considered fixed and definitive, um, based really on not much more than um, an arbitrary guess. Stapp was, was later able to prove in uh, one of his final experiments uh, in New Mexico that uh, the human body can survive um, deceleration forces beyond 40 and perhaps even 50 times uh, gravity. So he completely rewrote the book on what was possible. And what was, what was so important about that was that aircraft manufacturers had been reluctant to build cockpits and aircraft that could withstand those kinds of forces because they said there's no reason to build a stronger, safer cockpit 
because the human body can't even survive the deceleration force. STAP was able to force them to build better seats, better restraint systems, and stronger cockpits because he was finally able to show them the data that proved that a human being could survive it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Staff was also very meticulous and methodical in his uh, data collection and then uh, uh, tabulating and cataloging, and, and that was one of his strengths in, in, in uh, deriving and collecting and analyzing data. Yes. Dr. Stapp was uh, a scientist of the first order. He um, graduated with a PhD in biophysics from the University of Texas and then got a medical doctor degree at the University of Minnesota. He was, he was well-trained. He... Um, uh, he was uh, really on the leading edge of a lot of this kind of research, but you're absolutely right. The, you know, having the um, unassailable data to back up the, the, the films and some of the other uh, kinetic evidence that he gathered was absolutely crucial, and uh, it was just impossible for the aircraft manufacturers, for instance, to oppose him because he was able to show them um, exactly what had happened, and uh, he had all the data to prove it. Uh, switching back a little bit to uh, Dr. Staff's uh, earlier uh, uh, year, early years or early childhood, was there any formative, uh, during that formative stage, were there any uh, significant uh, events that impacted him personally or his uh, interest in life? Uh, because I know he had an early, early childhood tragedy in his family. Well, he did. And uh, uh, Staff uh, grew up as the, the son of um, missionaries in Brazil. So he had a, a, a fairly unusual childhood. Um, uh, his, his father was a, a Baptist minister, and um, he was uh, staff, and his brothers were homeschooled by their mother. Um, and uh, he was uh, sent back to Texas, where the family had originally come from, when he reached high school age. And uh, he went on to college at, at uh, Baylor University. And uh, the Christmas of his sophomore year in college, um, two tragedies almost simultaneously really changed the arc of his entire life. Um, the first one was that um, a young cousin of his, a two-year-old cousin, uh, was uh, sitting a little too close to a fireplace um, the day after Christmas and had thrown some wrapping paper into the fire, and the fire had flared up, and the little boy's pajamas caught on fire and he was horribly burned, and uh, the, the family sent for a doctor, and by the, doctor arrived, by the time the doctor arrived, it was really too late, and the little boy died. And it was not only a tragedy that affected Stapp, you know, the, obviously, the obvious tragedy of his, of his cousin dying, but <clears throat> Stapp was furious because he thought that surely the doctor should have been able to do more, and it made him very angry that um, there, wasn't, there hadn't been some way to save this little boy. Um, and it, it really affected him. And so about a week later, he headed back to resume classes at Baylor, only to find out that his um, college sweetheart, um, a woman that he had, uh, he, they had talked about getting married and having a family, and uh, her, she had been visiting her family in Los Angeles over Christmas break, and the family, their car had been hit um, from the side by a drunk driver, and she had been thrown from the car and killed. So in the space of a week, Stapp lost a cousin and then his sweetheart. And it really changed everything. Um, to that point, he had been thinking that perhaps he wanted to be a writer. He had uh, acted in school plays and had kind of been looking for his niche in life. And after these tragedies, he dropped out of all those courses and enrolled in the pre-med program. And it almost... It, almost overnight made the decision that he was going to devote his life to um, the easing of suffering and trying to keep people safe in accident situations. And he remained true to that for the rest of his life. It's kind of an amazingly um, focused uh, way that he dealt with this that, uh, as I say, it stuck with him for the rest of his life and really um, formed the core of his character and uh, Really, the the entire path of the rest of his life, it seems, was set uh, that one week um, way back in, uh, gosh, I'm going to say 1932. Mm -hmm. And he remained, he remained very true to his uh, uh, change that he had gone through his life. And then he, he was forever uh, interested in saving humanity and, and avoiding injuries and, and fat fatalities that occur from that. Yeah, and, and I think that's... Uh, 
I think it's fairly unusual, uh, you know, for us as human beings to remain, you know, that relentlessly focused for an entire lifetime. Staff lived to be um, uh, 89 years old, and for the entire rest of his life, that was the single-minded, almost fierce focus that he had, and uh, um, he never relented. Mm-hmm. The book is titled Sonic Wind. Uh, would you explain to our readers uh, where, how the term came about and how did the, uh, how did the book got the title and then what was that important milestone that uh, Dr. Staff was able to achieve? Well, the, uh, yes, you're right. The title, uh, Sonic Wind, and the subtitle is uh, the story of John Paul Staff um, and how a renegade doctor became the fastest man on earth. I got the title really working with my editor at Norton Liverite. His name is Philip Marino, a very talented editor, and we tried dozens of variations <clears throat> on that on that title. Um, Sonic Wind was the was actually the name of the rocket sled that Dr. Staff rode at Holloman Air Force Base in 1954 when he uh, conducted his final three deceleration experiments and. Uh, that it, it's, I'm, I'm going to tell you just briefly what happened in that experiment, and it's, it's very, very hard to visualize, almost impossible to believe it. But what he did uh, uh, that on December 10th, 1954, was in this rocket sled, again, kind of a steel soapbox racer on a, on a, on a rail track with nine rocket engines that were fired at, uh, simultaneously and shot him down the track. He went from zero to 639 miles per hour in about five seconds. Um, that's faster than any human being had ever gone in a ground vehicle. That's, that's um, hard enough to believe right there, but imagine zero to 639 miles per hour and then came to a complete stop in 1.3 seconds. So you imagine the deceleration force there, almost 640 miles to 640 miles per hour to zero in less than a second and a half. Um, even the folks that were working with staff, his colleagues, his team, the journalists who were there that day who witnessed this, later said even though they saw it, they didn't believe it. It, it didn't seem real. And uh, so not only did staff survive that, he was conscious at the end of this ride. He was not in very good shape, but he was conscious. He was taken to the hospital. And when they later asked him how he was feeling, he said, well, when I got to the hospital, I had to have uh, two lunches because I hadn't had any breakfast. Um, it was, he, he, always, he always kind of uh, was kind of an aw shucks approach to the, these amazing experiments, but uh, that was his biggest one. Now, what was he trying to achieve with that experiment of acceleration and deceleration in, in the sense that, um, you know, the, I guess uh, maybe I will let you explain the story that, you know, that when you're moving at a very fast uh, supersonic jets and then you have to eject the, uh, uh, the cockpit so that the pilots can get, go out and then, then parachute down. Uh, what was he trying to achieve through that, this process and why, why it was not done before? High speed aircraft, you know, it took a long time to get to the point where Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. Um, that was, uh, an achievement that a lot of people didn't think would be possible. And everything was focused on speed. Almost no one was thinking about, well, what would happen to a high-speed aircraft if it suddenly began to crack up in the stratosphere and the pilot had to eject and get out of that aircraft? If you are going at a, a tremendous speed and you suddenly eject, the, the deceleration forces, you slow down almost immediately. It's it's been described as a it's, it's akin to hitting a brick wall. And so if you're going to try to get out of an aircraft going that fast, you've got to have a really sophisticated restraint system that can that can you know keep the arm the, the limbs from flailing and the head from spinning around. And that's all going to work if you can if the human being can survive that kind of deceleration, if the internal organs can survive it, if the brain can survive it. And no one really knew if that was going to be possible. So that was largely what the, uh, the, the, the experiment in New Mexico was all about, trying to prove that, yes, the person could survive it if you could manage to do all this other stuff, um, restraint systems to keep, um, to, to keep them together, if, 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 you could, if you could imagine it that way. Um, 
there was going to be it wasn't going to make much sense to keep making uh you know our high speed jets going faster and faster if it wasn't going to be possible to survive some kind of accident and so Stapp really uh, thought it was going to be crucial to show that it's not the human body that's the failure point. The human body can take all manner of, of, of violent uh, forces. What you, what you need to focus on is are the systems to keep, again, to keep the arms and legs from flailing, keep the head from, from snapping forward or backward. Um, but you can only start to work on those things if you can first prove that the, that the human body itself can survive it. And what Stapp had learned early on in his, in his experiments is that the failure point for the human body, it looked like, were the eyeballs. That's where it goes bad first, um, because when you um, do what he did, which was plus 600 miles an hour to zero in, in a, a second and a half, the blood inside the capillaries in the eyes goes, goes flooding forward and floods the eyeball. And there was a very real concern on that last experiment that Stapp would lose his eyesight. It was a very real fear. And to the point where, in the weeks leading up to that experiment, Stapp practiced in the dark in his house at night, walking around, preparing simple meals, dressing himself to make sure that he would be competent in case he lost his eyes. He was, he was willing to take that risk, um, but... There were an awful lot of people on his team, his colleagues, who, who didn't want him to do it, and he tried very hard to talk him, talk him out of it uh, on the, based on the fear that he was going to lose his eyesight. So it was a, this was really dicey stuff that he was involved in. And uh, what's kind of amazing is that throughout all these really dangerous experiments that he conducted, and it was the thing he always said later he was the most proud of, um, that in all these experiments, they never had a single loss of human life or a single debilitating injury, and that's pretty impressive. Mm, mm, mm. Very impressive indeed. Um, the Dr. Staff also was instrumental in, in convincing a lot of uh, um, almost all automakers in designing better seats, and, and of course the seat belts that we use today. Yeah, that's and in some ways, even though it may be a less spectacular part of the story, I think in some ways it's a more almost a more important part of the story. Um, once Staff had had completed his final rocket sled run there in New Mexico, his superiors in the Air Force ordered him to cease and desist. They said, "You're too valuable to the Air Force. We're not going to allow you to expose yourself to any more of these kind of um, dangerous experiments." So he had to turn his sights. To, um, to something else, and the first thing that he thought of was auto safety, because one day while he was perusing some aircraft uh, statistics, he saw that the aircraft, uh, or the Air Force, excuse me, was losing more pilots every year in car crashes on Air Force bases than they were in airplane crashes. And so he began to think about auto safety, um, and it's really kind of the same problem. As cars go faster and faster, when they crash, it's not the it's not the deceleration force that's the danger. The danger is that in those days our highways were slaughterhouses. We didn't have seat belts, um, we didn't have safety glass, we didn't have airbags, um, we didn't have um, self-locking doors. And so what happened in crashes was people went flying. There was uh, the way they referred to it back then. The auto crash researchers was, they called it the second collision. The first collision is the car hitting something. The second collision is the occupant of the car then flying forward into the windshield or the dashboard. And uh, Stapp, as he began to look at this, realized it's the same problem. We've got to figure out how to restrain these people, and we've got to figure out how to keep them safe inside these vehicles. So even though the car hits a brick wall, the human being doesn't go flying into the windshield. And um, his thought was, if we do this right, we can allow people to walk away from, from crashes that were previously thought to be um, completely unsurvivable. And so he turned all of his energy to the issue of auto safety. And not necessarily a real popular move inside the Air Force, because his superiors um, argued, we're the Air Force. We deal with aircraft. What are you studying cars for? And so he was really opposed by the, 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 as he called them, the men at the mahogany desks in the Air Force. 
uh, for doing this research, but he fought and fought and testified before Congress um, can't, something like 12 different times, tried to support legislation on auto safety. He started the first independent auto safety conference in America, which still exists and still happens every year, the Staff Car Crash Conference. Um, and eventually, he was able to work with uh, some of his other colleagues in the auto safety world, Ralph Nader and others, to move legislation onto the desk of President Lyndon Johnson, who signed the landmark auto safety legislation in 1966 that for the first time mandated certain auto safety uh, requirements on the U.S. auto industry, seat belts, um, padded dashboards, safety glass, things that the auto industry um, fought tooth and nail, and it was, it was a real battle, and staff was right in the middle of all of it. Mm-hmm. Why uh, Dr. Staff is known as Renegade? Well, Renegade because staff's allegiance was always to his cause, and as we talked about earlier, his cause was finding ways to alleviate suffering and death in crash and other accident situations. That was what he was loyal to. So even though he spent almost his entire career in the United States Air Force, he was he was far from the tip, typical Air Force officer. For instance, he announced very early on in his Air Force career to his superiors that he would never agree to work on any weapons development program. He said, I'm a doctor, I save people, I don't kill people. And so um, he was a renegade in the sense that he was constantly fighting his superiors, fighting the Air Force, so that he could be allowed to do the important work that he really believed in. And because of that, he was really kind of an outcast. Um, He had a lot of enemies in the Air Force, people that opposed him, and um, so even as he was, you know, fighting his fight for um, auto safety and fighting his fight for aircraft safety, he was at the same time fighting his own organization who was, it seems, almost constantly trying to put fences around him and block um, some of the things he was trying to do. So that's where the renegade name uh, came from. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What was Dr. Staff's life uh, or how his life changed after he, be- he was on the cover of Time magazine and, and did he change or did he, or he did go on in, in educating the rest of the world and how and how his uh, innovations and inventions have helped the rest of uh, uh, almost a wider humanity or any perspective on that? Yeah, and it, it's an interesting one. Um, once, the, once he got all the publicity, you know, Staff was, uh, he was not somebody that courted publicity, but when he began to get it, and it was Time Magazine, it was Collier's, it was, um, you know, he was on television shows, This Is Your Life, and To Tell the Truth, and and um, initially he kind of opposed that kind of thing, but then he realized that that, you know, essentially that was another way to help the cause, to publicize the cause, and so he began to um, embrace that. He traveled the world. He was, you know, uh, he did a, uh, he was, you know, half a million air miles a year for decades as he went to every conference, accepted every invitation to speak to um, students and to uh, groups of scientists and doctors and engineers to preach the gospel of, of auto and aircraft safety. And, uh, and, and what uh, I point out in the book, which uh, makes me chuckle a little bit because Staff initially opposed these kinds of things. He seemed to think they were a little bit cheesy, and uh, he wasn't a big fan of television. But um, the truth of the matter is, is that Stapp uh, ended up enjoying a lot of this quite a bit. He liked an audience. He liked to. He was, in his own way, a bit of a performer. And uh, so, exactly what you said, he was really um, trying to find various ways to serve the cause of humanity around the world. Um, and he, uh, he, I, I, my guess is he turned down almost no invitation to um, go before a group or go into a situation where he could could share his knowledge and his perspective with the rest of the world. It was it was part of his life that I think he enjoyed very much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And 
our readers would also like to know a little bit more about the author Craig Ryan as well. You know, can you explain it? Can you give us a little bit of insights in your thought processes and in your little bit of in your background? How did you get interested in this subject and other books that you've written as well? Well, sure, and it's it's uh, uh, kind of a kind of a funny thing. I uh, uh, grew up in Oklahoma and Tennessee. I got an English degree from Reed College. And then I went to Brown University and got a master's degree in writing. I knew I wanted to write. I, had, I you know, from the, the time I was a little kid, I was always writing something. Um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with that. Um, and so, like lots of writers, when I got out of college, I did odd jobs, cab driver, etc. Um, I spent about 20 years in the computer industry as a technical writer back in the days when uh, the computer industry was new and fun. And um, I taught college for eight years. And I was writing all throughout all of this, um, and the, my initiation into the, uh, the the area of aerospace and aircraft really came almost by accident. I learned uh, to fly airplanes when I was in college, and I loved it, and I made my first parachute jump in the mid-1980s. And the, the parachute jump was, it was an, a, kind of a seminal experience for me because um, – once I had done it, it was it was such an uh, such an amazing experience that I immediately began to think about the history of parachuting. Who was the first person that ever did this? Um, what's, the, what's the highest parachute jump that's ever been made? And I started looking into these things and began to find these amazing stories that, that I had never heard of before. And uh, one of those stories was the story of an aircraft, uh, excuse me, an Air Force captain at the time named Joseph Kittinger, who in 1960 as part of an Air Force project, a project at Celtier, um, jumped from a high-altitude balloon at 100,000 feet above the surface of the Earth, that's almost 20 miles up there, um, jumped out and free fell back to Earth. And that was such an amazing story. And the more I learned about it, the more amazing it seemed to me. I began to learn about it. I began to travel around the country. I I got to know uh, Joe Kittinger, and I began to interview some of his colleagues and learn about other s similar stories. And uh, as it turns out, the, the um, senior project officer for that, that high-altitude parachute jump that Joe Kittinger made was John Paul Staff, and that's how I first learned about Dr. Staff. And so I, my first book was a book called The Pre-Astronauts that came out back in 1995, and it was a comprehensive history of high-altitude exploration in the pre-NASA days, it kind of covers the whole uh, that whole piece of history. It's sort of uh, if for re your readers um, who remember Tom Wolfe's book, The Right Stuff. Um, he talked about some of the um, the early days of supersonic aircraft back in the 1950s, and then sort of skips ahead to the Project Mercury astronauts in the early 60s. Um, my my book, The Three Astronauts, kind of covered the gap there between Chuck Yeager's first uh, sound barrier flight and the Mercury astronaut team. Uh, and by the way, Dr. Stapp was the, um, was the doctor who vetted that initial group of Mercury astronauts. He was very involved in the early days of the space program as well. Um, and then I, that's kind of odd. It, it was not part of my plan, but that kind of became my niche. I found a little piece of American history, and um, I've now written four books that have all are all sort of uh, somehow touch on that little piece of history, and uh, it's it's been uh, it's, it's totally unexpected in some ways when I go back and look at it. But um, it's been a it's it's been a wonderful ride. I've met some incredible people, and uh, I feel like I've sort of done my my little part to to fill in a little corner of of uh, American 20th century history that had previously been uncovered. And I think that. That's something that a nonfiction writer always looks for. You look for that little piece of the story that no one else has quite done yet. And I feel like I found that. And um, to be honest with you, from the very beginning, the story I really wanted to tell more than any of the other of these was the story of John Paul Staff. And so this has really been a thrill for me to um, – it, it took about five years to do this book, um, and I'm I'm very proud of it, and I'm just hoping that – it will introduce Dr. Staff to uh, a new generation of readers who might otherwise have you know, never heard of it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was just about to ask you, uh, if you could kind of explain where the research process took you, how long it took you to finish the book, and 
do you have any message for other uh, authors that you could uh, guide them or if you could give them some advice that what to expect if you when you are dealing with this kind of a subject matter? Sure. Um, one thing I would say is that you know I did have a little bit of a head start on this one. I said five years, but I really had a little head start because I had you know I had met Stapp back in uh, in 1990 and uh, got to know him a little bit. And by the way, uh, I've got to tell you this: it was uh, knowing Stapp was such a joy because of his sense of humor and his his eccentricities. Um, and uh, once I got to know Stapp, he would he would call me up on the phone out of the blue. Um, and it was, it was, it was always a, a bit of a shock to get one of his calls because they were usually very short. Um, and I'll give you an example. One of the calls I got from staff, I was at my office one day and my phone rang, I picked up the phone and, and this is the entire transcript of the conversation. He says, Ryan, staff here, the worth of a scientist can be measured by the degree to which he's willing to do battle with the savages and cannibals of management. Good day. Click. He hangs up. And, and this would happen all the time. And so you would get one of these calls, and the first whatever else you're doing, you stop it, you grab a, a pen and try to write it down so you don't forget it. Um, it was just a delightful thing to know the man. Um, and so here's, here's really the story on this book. He, before Stapp died, he had sort of handpicked his biographer, and it was a, a woman who he, he and his family had known for many years, um, who's a, a, an oral historian. Um, for the Society of Experimental um, uh, Aircraft Pilots, and she's a, 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 a very, very good at what she does. And she and Stapp had talked about her writing his biography when he passed away. And he had uh, given her a lot of materials. And uh, what happened was uh, she got involved in some other work and had some uh, family crises that came up, and she realized she was not going to be able to do the project. And so, um, you know, she knew that Stapp and I had talked and the Stapp liked me, and so um, she suggested to uh, Stapp's family that perhaps I ought to take this project on. And they called me and asked me if I, would, if I was interested. And, of course, I was. And uh, um, so they started sending me box after box after box of Stapp's papers and files, um, personal things that no one else had ever seen, thousands and thousands of letters um, Stapp published more than 250 papers in his lifetime. He gave hundreds and hundreds of speeches. The, the massive material that I had in my basement, um, I've got to tell you, my wife was not thrilled about this because we were losing our house to these boxes of, of papers um, on John Paul Stapp. Um, so the, the big challenge was to go through all this material and make some kind of sense of it, put it in some kind of order. And and I got to tell you, that was, in some ways, that was really the hard part of the project, just getting a handle on um, this, you know, this sea of paper. Um, and I don't think I'm not sure I could have done it without my wife's help. She's a school teacher, and she had taken a year off from um, there's a sabbatical from her school job, and she agreed to basically serve as my research assistant for that year. And if it hadn't been for her help organizing this material, I'm not sure I could have even done the book. But I guess if I have any piece of advice for writers who are working on a project like this, it would, and it's, it's kind of a tough piece of advice, and I can't remember who I heard it from. This comes from another writer, so this is not original with me, but the line is, turn every page. You've got 10,000 pieces of paper sitting there. You really do have to look at every one of them. You may not have to you know, read through every single one once you determine what it is, but you've got to look at everything. Don't assume that, oh, I've probably seen most of it. I don't need to go look at You need to go look at all of it. You need to go to every archive. You really need to be as exhaustive as you can because you never know when you're going to find that one nugget that's going to change everything. And so if I have a piece of advice, it would just be that. It's hard work, but you've got to be thorough. You've got to look at it all. And then you need to think critically about it and and Here's the truth about biography in my mind, and that is there's no such thing as a definitive and final biography of anyone. A biography is merely the story that one writer is telling about another person's life. There are many possible, obviously possible versions of that life. So this is just your version of the life. So think it through. Don't be afraid of your own conclusions. 
and be true to those and 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 go forth because here's the here's what's going to happen no matter what you write you're going to displease some people there may be some people in the family who didn't want you to tell that particular story there may be a colleague who says didn't want you to tell that piece or says no really it was this other way so you've got to to make your own calls and you got to stick with them and uh put your version of that story out there and be ready to defend it, but understand that there are other versions of that story that can be written. How many hundreds of versions of the Abraham Lincoln story are out there? There, you know, this can go on forever. So you do your best, get your own take on it, be true to it, put it out there, and from that point on, it's it's out of your hands, and the world's going to decide what they think of it. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, this was a very enjoyable experience. Uh, I would uh, like to urge all of our listeners to get the book and read. Uh, it's a fascinating topic, a uh, fascinating person in the uh, uh, book as well, and it's very well written. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much for your time and your comments. I thank you, sir. This has been a delight. Thank you.